busy day on Friday. Fridays are my day off, but the reality is some Fridays are less off than others. Uh, this, this turned out to be a pretty busy off day on Friday. And I spent the, the part of the late afternoon into early evening with the family at the hospital, making difficult decisions. And uh, that was a, a difficult place for everybody to be. And the reality is I had to be somewhere else by six. I had to be here by six to help drive 17 junior and senior high kids to the movies. Just the reality of life. And so I left the hospital about quarter after five so I could come home, change clothes real quick, and get Hunter and get over here. And I had told Joanne that I would stop by KFC and get her dinner because she was going to be home by herself. So I drove through KFC, and I was hoping to get through there quickly. And I was delighted to pull up to the, the drive-thru and find one only one car sitting there placing an order. Thought, that's good. Well, my window was kind of fogged, so I rolled my window down so I could see the menu board while I was waiting my turn. I was right behind the gentleman who was ordering, so I could hear the entire conversation that went on from them since my window was down. And there was some confusion between he and the woman inside, so his order took a little longer than it should have. But then she said, he apparently ordered several biscuits, because then she said, it's going to be seven minutes on your biscuits. Do you want to wait? And I'm thinking in my head, okay, if he waits seven minutes for his biscuits, I have to wait seven minutes for his biscuits as well. So I said, say no, say no. <laughs> and right at that moment, two things struck me. One was, my window was still down. <laughs> and two was, I talk really loudly. <laughs> he heard me. <laughs> and I know he heard me because he stopped looking at the menu board and whipped his head back at me <laughs> and stared at me. And I kind of smiled and rolled my window up and pretended to play with the radio. <laughs> I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Okay? There's a Swedish proverb that says, to share sorrow is half a sorrow, but to share joy is double the joy. So how do you define joy this morning? You know, I'm, I'm no big surprise that I'm a big baseball fan. In 1988, the L.A. Dodgers won the World Series, and the star of that year was a pitcher named Laurel Hirschheiser. He won the Cy Young that year, he won the playoff MVP, he won the World Series MVP. He was unbelievable that year. And before the ninth inning of the fifth and decisive game of the World Series, he was pitching a complete game shutout to win the series for the Dodgers. But before the ninth inning, the TV cameras caught him in the dugout by himself, and his lips were moving. And it appeared that he was talking to himself. And the, the, the sports guys kind of wondered what he was doing, but then they went on and they won the game, and he, they won the series, and he won the MVP. The next night, he appeared on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And when he was sitting there with Carson, they showed that clip of him talking, and Carson said to him, what were you saying in the dugout? And Hershiser obviously got kind of embarrassed, and he said, oh, I wasn't saying anything. And Carson pushed him a bit, you know, come on, you were clearly doing something. And Hershiser finally confessed that he was singing. And Carson said, well, what, what were you singing? And sing it for us. And Hershiser said, I'm not a singer. And the audience started clapping and getting behind it and, and cheering. And finally, he, he said, um, okay, fine. And he started singing. And he sang, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And Carson was speechless. And the crowd was just complete silence. Nobody just, nobody knew what to do with that. They didn't know how to wrap their heads around that. And then one person started applauding. And then the whole audience started clapping. And they stood. And they gave him a standing ovation. And it was because they saw the joy in Oral Hirschheiser's face as he sang the doxology on national television. They saw the joy. This time of year often creates a forced expectation of joy. And that serves to highlight what's both wrong and missing in our lives often. If you see a marked difference between your life and what society presents as the cultural norm for joy, you tend to feel isolated and depressed. But I want to tell you today that joy from God can restore a sense of wholeness and a sense of community Amen. at this time of year. 
And I want to share a passage from the book of 1 John that talks about that, starting with the very first verse. And again, remember, this is the Eugene Peterson message interpretation. You'll hear a difference in the language, but I like the way he says it. From the very first day, we were there, taking it all in. We heard it with our own ears. We saw it with our own eyes. We verified it with our own hands. The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen. And now we're telling you in most sober prose that, we wit that what we witnessed was incredibly this. The infinite life of God himself took shape before us. We saw it. We heard it. And now we're telling you so you can experience it along with us. This experience of communion with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And our motive for writing this is simply this. We want you to enjoy this too. Your joy will double our joy. You know, some people just have no joy. Guy goes into a doctor's office and he's confronted with the receptionist and he says, I have a sore throat. Just a sore throat, and I'd just like the doctor to look at it. She says, go down the hall, get in the first door on the right, take your clothes off, and wait. And he said, well, man, man it's just a sore throat. I, that's not really necessary, is it? Down the hall, first door on your right, take your clothes off. But hall door closed now. So he goes down the hall, and he goes to the first door on the right, and he opens it, and he's confronted with a man sitting in his boxer shorts in this room, shivering. And it's a little awkward, and so the man coming in says, Boy, that, that receptionist sure is joyless, isn't she? I just have a sore throat, and she told me to come in here and take my clothes off. And the man in his boxer shorts says, Do you think that's bad? I'm just a UPS man. <laughs> the mistake many people make is they confuse happiness and joy. And that's easy to do. Easy to do. The Bible mentions joy or rejoicing about 330 times, but it only mentions happiness about 26 times. And here's why, in my opinion. Happiness depends on your circumstance. If all the planets align just right, you're happy. But others have the ability to take happiness away from you. We are conditioned by and often dependent upon what is happening to us to be happy. If people treat me well, if things are going my way, then I'm happy. But if my circumstances are not favorable, then I'm unhappy. It's as simple as that. Joy, on the other hand, throbs throughout the book of Scripture as a profound, compelling quality of life that transcends the difficulty that impacts God's people. Joy is not a surface-level happiness, but it is something deeply rooted in our souls. It's the divine dimension of living that is not shackled by our circumstance. Joy is the evidence of God's presence in our lives. If God is in your life, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then the joy of the Lord will be obvious in you. Joy is a God-given gift that lives within us. And because of that, I think there are two kinds of people. There are thermostat people and there are thermometer people. A thermometer reflects the climate of the room in which it is. If the room's cold, the thermometer's cold. If the room's hot, the thermometer's hot. But a thermostat can change the climate of the room. By setting it a certain way, a thermostat can make a cold room into warm, or it can make a hot room into cool. I think a joy-filled Christian is a thermostat person. Because a joy-filled Christian can change the climate of the room when they walk into it. You ever seen that happen? You've been in a room where everybody's negative and everybody's complaining and everything's going wrong. And then a joy-filled Christian, a thermostat person, enters the room. And before you know it, the whole climate changes. God wants thermostat folk. He wants joy-filled people in his church. And more importantly, in the world. People who don't dwell on the negative, but focus on the positive. People who see the good things that God is doing in the church and in the world. Do you have joy? True joy? New Testament, com New Testament commentator William Barclay. I don't know about you, John, but one of my favorite New Testament commentators, in fact. He said this. 
The gloomy Christian, the gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms. And then he goes on to say, nothing in religious history has done Christianity more harm than its connection with black clothes and long faces. And to that I say, amen, Mr. Barclay.